Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to welcome our guests who came, some of them, all the way from San Paolo. San Paolo. Um, and I was also want to thank everybody else here. Um, uh, in particular, I wanted to thank uh, Bruno Carvalho, who's been a, uh, an, a very important piece in the organization of this, uh, not only this session, but I would say of the uh, Fluvial Metropolis project from its inception. Um, and it's one more adventure in the number of projects that we concocted together in the last few years. Um, so this uh, fluvial, what we call the Fluvial Metropolis Initiative, was created as a joint Princeton University, University of San Paulo project to conduct a research program on the future transformation of urban infrastructure, in particular water infrastructure, and its effects on urban space and form. And also to elaborate, I mean, this is our uh, ambitious idea, to elaborate an environmental approach to the design of fluvial infrastructure in urban and suburban areas of New York, New Jersey, and in the Sao Paulo metropolitan region. Um, in contrast to the strict technocratic management of water infrastructure in the 20th century, the demands of 21st century urbanization require new concepts of water infrastructure able to negotiate the conflicting uses of water for sustaining life as well as for industrial production, for balancing the demands of clean water for humans and animals, and the recycling of water for growing and feeding plants. And finally, for maintaining landscapes for pleasure that will perhaps define the identity of the future fluvial metropolis. So that's in a way our goal, our objective. The interdisciplinary research network, including the Princeton and the USP teams, will work in parallel meeting twice a year for the next three years, alternating between Princeton and Sao Paulo. The meetings organized as workshops and conferences, including faculty and students, will focus on the precedents, context, potentials of the water ring for Sao Paulo, or the Idranel project, as um, a recent project that proposes a far-reaching intervention, a 106 miles long waterway ring that seeks to radically reorganize the growth of South American largest metropolis. The Sao Paulo Metropolitan Waterway Ring Project as a network of rivers, reservoirs, and artificial canal was conceived 20 years ago as a master research project followed by a PhD thesis by Alexandre, Alexandre Delijajkov, who is one of the presenters this morning. As I'm saying, this project in a way jump-started the imagination that we developed into this project, into this program. This workshop is the first in a series of encounters in the next three years between the two teams, in Princeton and in USP. Uh, it provides an opportunity to jumpstart the process by opening up the major themes that will be developed by the research network. And at the same time, it offers the context for the two teams to get together and plan the agenda for the next three years. In today's morning session, we'll deal with the past, the present, and the potential future of inland waterways in the US and Brazil. In the afternoon session, we will discuss environmental challenges and solutions in the Sao Paulo metropolitan and macro metropolitan area and in the New York, New Jersey coastline. So the, we, we call the morning session precedents and possibilities. Chris Barr of the Hagley Museum and Library will re-examine, I'm going to give you a very quick uh, overview of the full day, and then I guess uh, we'll have the full uh, presentations. 
so Chris Barrer from the Hagley Museum and Library will re-examine the early development of port cities running along the northeast of the states between Boston and Norfolk by looking at the interaction of humans with their environment and focusing on inland waterways rather than on the sea. Actually, <coughs> most of the, well, the both uh, morning presentations are about inland wa inland waters, waterways. Alexandre Delejaikov, professor of architecture of the FAO, USP, will present the Hydranel project for Sao Paulo, the metropolitan water ring of navigable canals composed of the rivers Tiete, Pineiros, and the reservoirs, and an artificial canal connecting these reservoirs to the rivers, adding up to those 105 miles of waterways. The morning session will be moderated by Alison Eisenberg, professor of history at the history department here in Princeton University, and I thank you for <coughs> um, <coughs> giving us this day of morning. And the afternoon session uh, we call the Engineering Fluvial City session. And um, Ricardo Toledo Silva, uh, who is actually the Deputy uh, Secretary of Energy of the State of Sao Paulo and Professor uh, of FAO USP, uh, will describe the major challenges presented by the urban infrastructure to the Sao Paulo metropolitan region with a particular focus on the water infrastructure. And however, as uh, Professor uh, Toledo told me yesterday, and I totally agree with him, you can't really separate water infrastructure from the other urban infrastructures. So I guess we'll get that larger view. Uh, Paul Lewis, Associate Professor of Architecture here at the School of Architecture, will present an exploration of the role of section as the design tool in resilient planning for urban and suburban areas, anticipating sea level rise. Actually, this is, a, uh, Paul is part of a larger team and um, uh, who have been working on uh, the, these issues and actually recently uh, presented uh, his work in a conference. So I also thank you for um, being here with us today. Uh, the afternoon session will be moderated by Vera Candiani, Associate Professor of History, the History Department, Princeton University. So um, now uh, we'll start the morning session with uh, uh, Professor Barr. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, rather than sort of go over the paper point by point, what I thought I would do is show a series of slides and maps uh, which I hope will amplify some of the points that I made in the paper. And what I want to focus on is primarily uh, the role of natural and artificial waterways in uh, integrating regions and also their influence on urban form. Uh, and in many cases that influence persisted long after the waterways themselves had ceased to function as viable uh, means of transportation. Um, we're going to need to darken the room, I think. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, much. Okay. Um, for people who may be less familiar with uh, Eastern U.S. geography, uh, these are the sort of major rivers of the United States that are navigable without very much uh, improvement. And of course, you have the Mississippi system, which is the main continental river uh, of this part of North America. And on the coast, you have a series of tidal rivers which come inland a considerable distance running particularly south of the Chesapeake Bay here. Uh, one thing this does though is that um, you'll note that the region that we're going to be talking about is rather poor in rivers other than the Ohio River and the Great Lakes and the Hudson River here. And what I intend to discuss is primarily how the people within this region sought to compensate for their lack of na naturally navigable waterways through various artificial means. The other interesting point about this photo is that, uh, that it, if you look at this tidewater zone with its many, many rivers, it, it essentially defines an area of plantation agriculture. 
uh, in the north here you would have tobacco, you would have rice down in South Carolina, and all through here you would have cotton, uh, which is again, a, a, and that involves usually slave labor for one thing as opposed to the free labor and the small farms and small industries that you find further north. Um, just for those of you who don't, are not, again, not familiar, these are sort of the locations of major points of interest. Um, and then also the major river systems. You've got the, um, let's see, well, you have the Hudson going from north and south here, the Mohawk River, um, the Delaware River south of that, and the Susquehanna Basin, which is the largest on the, uh, in this part of the East Coast. Uh, the Potomac River, which runs through uh, Washington, D.C., and in Virginia, we have the James and the Roanoke. And then separated by the Appalachian Mountains, on the other side, we have the Allegheny, Ohio system. Um, this sort of gives you the genesis of both of those things. This is the extent of the last um, Ice Age glacier, which I mentioned in the paper, and it, you see that it does two things. It helps shape New York Harbor and give it a very special characteristic. And it also shapes the Ohio River by blocking what otherwise would have been uh, meandering channels in which rivers would have gone north and were turned by the ice sheet. So you've got a large, uh, relatively easily navigable highway that runs from right really at the side of the, the blockading mountains all the way into the heart of the continent. And that, that and plus the, ga the Great Lakes, which are also gouged out by the glaciers, are the two sort of major water features in this region. Um, this is a geologic uh, map, and you can see, I think, the point I made in the paper. New England essentially is a sort of exotic terrain that's been squashed onto the east coast of North America, uh, which is one reason why I'm not going to discuss it, because it has really very special characteristics. But you'll see that the main rivers run north and south, which doesn't do you any good if you want to go to the west. And also that you have a barrier with no real water gaps or anything in it running the entire length of New England. Uh, by contrast, you'll see in New York, you've got a low-level passage through and around the mountains. Um, you will have um, here the Hudson River breaks through the uh, first mountain barrier. Also, when you get down to the Delaware, it does the same. And especially here around the, where the Susquehanna River is, the mountain barrier is relatively absent. Uh, then when you get to the south, you get a much higher uh, mountain barrier, increasing in height as you go further south so that the uh, abilities to cross it become more and more difficult. Uh, the other thing is you have this kind of shear zone in what's called the Valley and Ridge Province, and you can see that in Pennsylvania, uh, it's much wider um, than in, it is further south. Again, this is sort of a, a process of tectonic collisions, and what you get here then is you get a lot of fertile um, valleys interspersed with the ridges so that you have a fairly um, a fairly uh, a, a, a landscape that has potential prosperity, whereas the further south you go, the more the valleys are narrowed and crushed, and uh, uh, therefore there's less fertile land available. So you, ha you basically have two corridors here. You have one relatively low-level one, and then you have ones that go across here, where you still have to sort of wend your way through mountains, but then you have a very short crossing until you get to the uh, Ohio system on the other side. This is a geologic cross-section, just to give you a quick idea of what it looks like. This is down to a depth of about 10 kilometers. And you can see the, 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 ma the major regions which have a different influence on their water courses. You've got the Piedmont region, which is all kind of crushed and squashed together. And then you have the, um, uh, the Blue Ridge, which is a sort of slice of deep rock that's kind of pushed up from below. And then in the Ridge and Valley province, you've got all these things where there was a lateral pressure and it's failed and buckled but it's not crushed in the same way, and this is what gives you those alternating ridges and valleys. Then when you get further west, you get the uh, part that wasn't really affected, and it's a, a flat plateau. This is a, what you sort of would find in the, in the plateau region. You would get vertical waterfalls like this, which are obviously um, severe barriers to navigation, and you would have to portage or build some sort of artificial passage around, around them. Um, these are the uh, tidewater rivers that define the tidewater zone in the states under study. We've got the Hudson, which by fluke of the glaciers is tidal all the way up uh, for a distance of over 100 kilometers. Um, we have the Delaware that's navigable up to Trenton, but I'm not too far from here, Chesapeake Bay, the Potomac that's navigable to Washington, and then the rivers of Virginia. And you'll also notice that the, the fall line or the zone that separates the uh, uh, naturally navigable river starts to veer uh, away from the coast and away from the mountains the further south you get. 
This is the uh, situation of the rivers uh, in the area that we're talking about that are not navigable constantly under natural conditions, but are navigable intermittently. And what that means is they, they're navigable um, often for as little as a few weeks uh, during the spring and fall floods. And uh, what you have here in the, uh, the blue routes, like the Delaware, the Susquehanna, these are sort of the main ones that are navigable for relatively large loads at a, for a relatively longer time. The red, one, the red rivers, and you can see there's a really vast network of them, um, are de what are called descending only. And what this means is you can float small rafts and small boats out of them on the very short time frames when you have uh, very high water. You'll also know it inter for interesting that there, aside from the Mohawk and this natural corridor in here, New York is sort of devoid of this kind of river system. Uh, so what you get is a very special condition where you can build a canal across here because you've got flat ground. Here you've got, um, first of all, the things lead down away from New York, and uh, secondly, you've got this sort of very elaborate zone of, of very temporary navigation. One thing, that, uh, another thing that this does is that, again, these rivers, when you float your produce down them, bring you to important ports. You've got Philadelphia here, and you've got Baltimore here. Um, and that really creates at least the basis of a commerce between these upcountry areas that are producing raw materials like flour, uh, whiskey, timber, and so on, um, and the uh, ports which uh, either consume them or export them. So even though this is a very highly imperfect system, it's better than nothing, and it does help create a kind of market orientation and the development of markets in areas that might be otherwise isolated. And that contrasts us, when you, the further south you go, you see less and less of this. And therefore, to some extent, these areas become much more isolated. Once you get down here, in fact, the rivers don't flow to the coast and there's no port here. They flow into the interior, down, down into the deep south. So this area becomes really sort of a very water conscious. And um, it does two things. First of all, it, it ends sort of uh, social and economic isolation in this zone, and it also, uh, means that you get people there who are water conscious and want to improve their state by doing things with their water resources. These are just some of the typical um, vehicles that were used. These are timber rafts, which were very common all through the, second, uh, the first part of the uh, 19th century and sometimes even into the later uh, part of the 19th century. This is the so-called Durham boat, which is what was used to ascend streams. And uh, what, what you did, these would carry about uh, that's sometimes about three tons or so of uh, burden. Uh, you see that um, on, the, on the gunnels there's a walking platform and men would actually stand there, they would jab these poles in the riverbed and then they would literally walk the boat upstream with their feet. Uh, the, when they were in still water they could sail or row or, or do other things, but it was very laborious but at the same time it was much better than nothing. Uh, this is a, what they call an arc which was used to float coal down the major rivers. Um, this is a larger version, which is generally called the flat boat that's used on the western rivers. And these were big enough that you could uh, move uh, entire families who were emigrating uh, larger cargoes. This is just a quickie brief on canal technology if you're not familiar with it. Uh, I decided to use modern pictures because they actually show things a little clearer. You can get bird's eye views. There are no photographs, obviously. Uh, and it's sometimes hard to interpret the drawings. This is just the basis of a lock, which is the, major, the, the basic element of an artificial canal. Uh, and again, you can see it, how it works like an elevator. I mean, a boat will come in at the low level, it's filled up with water, and then sails out at the higher level. This boat's going down the other way. Um, this is a typical slack water dam. This, is, again, is a modern version, uh, probably on the Tennessee River. But they built dams of this sort. What you would do is you would take a river that was a kind of roller coaster with rapids and, and make a series of pools out of it. Um, so, and then you would simply join the pools by a lock. And one, of, one advantage of this method is that you can make your lock big enough to uh, accommodate a steamboat, uh, which was again done especially on the western rivers. This is just uh, showing how canals were dug, and they were usually dug by hand uh, with black powder for blasting when necessary. And all it, was, all it entailed was to create a trapezoidal prism, which was partly filled with water. And you would simply create it by basically cut and fill methods of various kinds. This is from a contemporary uh, handbook for canal builders. Uh, this is a profile which shows you how 
um, a canal or slag water system will take a roller coaster river and essentially turn it into a stair step. Um, these are other canals. This is what I talked about in the paper about summit canals and dry summits. This is the profile of the Erie Canal, which is a summit canal because it actually connects at least three separate drainage basins, but it's also relatively flat. Um, this is the problem you get with a summit canal when you try to go over uh, an evenly moderate, a moderately high mountain range like the Appalachians. Um, in fact, of course, this is the CNO Canal, which starts in Washington, D.C. It was actually only completed as far as Cumberland here. You can see the, in a sense, pipe dream element of trying to build lockage up onto a mountain where there's progressively less and less water and then punch a four mile long tunnel through the top of the mountain. So this really points out the limitations of where uh, canals could be built. Uh, just to give you a flavor of what these 19th century towpath canals look like, this is a late survival. A lot of the boats were run by families. They would, be, they would either own their own boat, kind of like an independent trucker, or uh, they would hire on to run a boat for a company. Uh, but the family would usually travel together, take turns minding the draft animals, uh, again, it's a very uh, transient kind of life, a life of being an outsider. Uh, you spend the maybe three to four months ashore somewhere, and the rest of the time you're on the move. Um, this is a typical steamboat of the early era. These, these are what were used on the tidewater rivers uh, all through this region. Now, these are the, uh, well, we're going to sort of fast forward through the uh, physical development of the canal system. Each of the states started more or less at the, at, the, I mean, at the large states, especially we're talking about New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, um, started about the same place at the time the national government was founded. And they started trying to clear their rivers in response to uh, requests from the backcountry and making sure that the backcountry was connected to the more settled uh, capital regions. Um, again, all of these projects failed. But uh, you can see what Philadelphia, for example, was trying to connect Philadelphia with the Susquehanna River Basin to capture its traffic. Baltimore was trying to improve the lower Susquehanna River. Uh, Washington was trying to um, go around the falls of the Potomac and improve the Potomac. All of these things pretty much came to naught. Um, in various cases, the, the Potomac Project was sponsored by George Washington. George Washington died in 1799, and that kind of knocked the prop out from under it. Um, in Pennsylvania, all of these developments were uh, financed by land speculators. The land bubble broke in 1796, and a lot of those folks wound up in debtor's prison and died there. Um, New York was a little bit more successful in the sense that it got a rudimentary system about halfway to the lake. Um, instead, what people did, rather than invest in canals, and again, I, the paper pointed out how there are whole zones, especially in the so-called Piedmont that are poor in navigable streams was to build turnpike roads, which are a lot cheaper. And this is the extent of the turnpike road network that existed in 1815. You can see New York and New England are really making, have made great progress getting across the mountains. Um, Philadelphia here and Baltimore here are kind of competing for this tributary backcountry um, in, in the uh, southeastern part of Pennsylvania and Maryland. Uh, Virginia is sort of lay, uh, lagging behind already and will continue to lag behind just because it has fewer resources, although it, again, it's still in the race. It's, it's still part of the system. Jump ahead another 15 years. Uh, you can see that uh, Pennsylvania especially is, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, um, Pennsylvania is, um, has completed uh, roads across the state to reach the Ohio River and the Great Lakes. Um, the uh, Virginia has built, finally built a turnpike over its mountainous part. Um, turnpike building up here is actually s slowing down and stopping because canals have already started to replace them. Um, okay, now we have the, what are the, basically the two first big canal projects that are, and the only ones to really be finished in any kind of major way before 1825. The first is the Erie Canal, which goes from Albany to Buffalo, and that's going to become the axis of east-west trade for very obvious reasons, it's the one low-level passage. And the other one is the Schuylkill Canal in Philadelphia, which is not designed as an east-west uh, passageway, but is in fact an, uh, going to become an axis of heavy industry. If we jump ahead to 1835, now canal building is underway everywhere. New York is flushing out its uh, system with branches. 
Pennsylvania has improved most of its uh, larger river systems. Uh, again, it's had to build a railroad rather than a canal to get across the mountain, this little link right here. Um, but it now, has, it now it's beginning to compete for the trade of, of the Ohio Valley especially. You can see again, uh, the Chesapeake in Ohio is sort of falling behind and the Virginia systems even more so. Uh, canal building is already spreading to the Midwest and we have a canal between the Ohio River uh, at Portsmouth and, and Cleveland. Uh, we're starting to have the beginnings of a canal system at Cincinnati. Um, what's happening here is the states are all going hog wild in a construction boom and a development boom and trying to build uh, canal mileage as quickly as they can. The result is something like this uh, after the bubble goes uh, bust again in the late 1830s. Um, the Midwestern states have greatly increased their canal mileage, but they're mired in debt. Michigan, which is very thinly populated, is just clearing some rivers that hasn't been able to build a canal. Pennsylvania's flushed out its canal system and gone, uh, had gone into default. Um, we can also see that there's now a canal down the whole length of the Susquehanna River. Um, actually, if we went back, uh, you, you would have seen that there were the, uh, the two lateral canals, the uh, Delaware and Raritan across the neck of New Jersey and the Chesapeake and Delaware here. So you're beginning to get the um, sort of cross-city linkage that I talked about in the paper. Um, again, you can see Virginia still moving but falling further and further behind. Um, by 1860, the canal system is complete pretty much. Um, the, in fact, it, in places in the Midwest, it's already starting to succumb and there's starting to be abandonments. Um, one of the things you can see by this, though, is the orientation of all these canals in the Midwest tend to focus toward the Northeast. And so what happens is a lot of the traffic coming out of these rapidly developing Midwestern states is moving this way to Lake Erie where it can reach the Erie Canal and come around to New York. Um, another thing to notice here is also in, is the rise of Chicago here, again caused by a canal linking Lake Michigan and the Mississippi-Illinois River. The reason the canals are uh, dying at this point is this is the railroad network of the same era. And you can see again that the same kind of hierarchy and rankings uh, have been preserved in the railroad era. We've got two railroads from New York to the west, we've got one from Philadelphia, we've got one from Baltimore. Virginia's stymied at the foot of the mountains. What Virginia manages to build instead is a railroad that goes down into the deep south, and that helps kind of define what the Confederacy is going to be, uh, become in just a, a year. Um, another thing is to note that the canal pattern in the, uh, is repeated by the railroads in the Midwest. You've got a railroad from Cleveland to Cincinnati, and anything coming from further west can be taken by that railroad, diverted, and forwarded to the, the railroads of New York. The railroads of uh, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and with Baltimore are sort of left to fight over this area in eastern Ohio, and then um, Pennsylvania basically has one route to Chicago and one route to Cincinnati. Baltimore has one route to Cincinnati. Um, this is, a, again, a, a flavor of the uh, coastal canals that I was talking about and why they're different than those canals we saw with the, with the family-operated boats. Uh, they were built wide enough uh, and enlarged to the point where they could take steam tows. And once you have a system like this, you can tow these boats, you know, in canals, but you can also tow them around the navigable waterway system. So you have, you have the beginnings of an integrated system. This is the uh, Delaware and Rarick Canal up in New Brunswick. And again, you can see that it was large enough to accommodate small steam boats. Uh, I want to sort of enlarge on that idea of integration that these canals caused by looking at the coal and iron co complex that developed in this region. The, um, oops, sorry. The uh, orange tints are coal fields. These are anthracite coal, which is hard coal used mostly for domestic purposes. Uh, this is bituminous coal, which is smokier and dirtier. Um, what you'll see is that as early as 1845, each of the um, major anthracite coal fields is tapped by uh, a whole series of canals which can take you, depending on where you are, um, you can come down the Delaware River, down the Schuylkill to Philadelphia. You can do the same thing by coming around and going up the Delaware and Raritan to can, uh, Canal to New York. You can come down the Susquehanna and go through the CMD and the Delaware and Raritan also. So you not only have these canals funneling raw materials again across the grain of the land, then you have these links 
of large canals and navigable streams um, that will essentially create what is really sort of the equivalent of the modern I-95, which will allow you to distribute these goods um, and, and to seek whichever market seems to be the most appropriate for them. Um, this is for fast forwarding again. And you can see not only now the canals, um, as they were being supplemented and, and surpassed by railroads generally, you can see now that there are railroads penetrating each of the coal regions. Uh, they've started to reach the bituminous coal, which is now becoming available for other purposes than, than domestic heating. And uh, I've shown on this map only those railroads which are hauling coal, not the more dense network that didn't. So these are really the main routes. And again, you have the same sort of situation where coal can come down and be distributed by way of these canals um, to any of the major markets. The other thing that you can see is the growth of, of heavy um, coal using iron blast furnaces and rail rolling mills, which are sort of the, uh, the new uh, dominant form of iron and steel technology, which will grow further, and see how they're clustered again, starting, starting to grow first along the canals, and eventually railroads are built alongside to uh, compete with the canal. But you can see how they cluster along the Susquehanna, and especially in this industrial corridor along the Schuylkill Canal, which we saw before. And that, that really was entirely the work, of, uh, beginning the work uh, set up by the Schuylkill Canal. Uh, this is just, again, a sample to show you how uh, coal was loaded from railroad cars into the canal boats. Uh, this is at Cumberland, Maryland. Uh, this is a typical early, this is uh, uh, the Crane Ironworks in Catasauqua, which is the, uh, the first big anthracite uh, blast furnace. And you can see it's built right on the canal, and there are the canal boats that bring in the raw materials. And the canal actually supplied originally the water power. Uh, now what I want to do is switch to the other uh, aspect of the, of the presentation, which is to talk about uh, the influence of waterways and canals on urban form. And I'm going to go through each of the three, well, to use the term of the conference, fluvial metropolises, and look at its fluvial endowment. And again, this is a map of showing uh, conditions in 1860. Uh, again, New York is the fluvial metropolis par excellence. It has the Hudson River, which is over a kilometer wide. Um, it has all these bays and inlets which link it to the ocean, to Long Island Sound. It has a big anchorage uh, protected, and all these back channels which uh, can be used for small craft. You can see all the little dotted lines here, which are, are regular uh, ferry boat routes for carrying people and, and vehicles. Um, you can also see the way the uh, development of the city is clustered around uh, the main part of Manhattan that, that's in the waterfront, and we'll enlarge on that in a minute. Also note that there's only one canal coming into New York directly, the Morris Canal. What happens is, in fact, that the canals that feed New York are coming into either the Hudson River way, way up here, or they're coming into uh, from New Brunswick, which you come up around behind Staten Island. Um, and again, that means that goods coming in and out by canal can be floated around and towed by steamboats, like we saw on the other slide, anywhere around the harbor. Um, and that sort of sets the pattern for handling freight in New York Harbor for over a century. Uh, and we'll see a little bit more of that in a minute. Um, it, it gives a great fluidity to the uh, metropolis in its uh, 19th century incarnation, it becomes more of a handicap later on. This just gives you an idea of the natural tidewater navigation that where New York sits at the hub. It's got Long Island Sound with a semi-protected route that allows a short portage to Boston. Uh, you have navigable rivers going into southern New England, so southern New England becomes tributary to New York. You've got the Hudson River all the way up to Albany and Troy and the Erie Canal traffic being towed up and down it. Uh, and then you have the smaller rivers like the Raritan that comes to New Brunswick. Uh, with its short portage, you know, through where we are now to Trenton. Uh, these are the steamboat lines that were in place as early as 1840. Uh, you can see again the Hudson River is one main line and the Long Island Sound is another. Uh, very, very dense traffic here. Um, this is the modern city, just to give you an idea of how that was shaped. You can again see that this, uh, this fluvial environment that, we were, that I was speaking about, you can see all the small crap in the harbor being things being towed this way and that, all the various piers. The waterfront is entirely occupied by commerce, um, almost as far as you can go. You have to get up where the river is too narrow or the banks are too high before you start to get uh, uh, non-commercial uses. You get villas of, of wealthy people or parkland. 
Um, if we go ahead, we can look at that again. You can see the New Jersey Shore all occupied by things like railroad yards. Uh, again, especially note all these little barges and things being towed back and forth and all the barges and ships at the various piers. Uh, this is a, an aerial view of the narrow of the uh, upper bay looking toward the narrows and out to the ocean. Uh, this was the anchorage where ships from all over the world would come and anchor while they were waiting for berths or waiting for cargoes. Um, again, this is an aerial view of, of the Hudson River um, in the uh, very early 1930s. Um, again, you can see the enormous amount of small craft of barges. You can see uh, railroad cars being pushed around and barges being pushed around, ferry boats going back and forth. And then, of course, you have um, these big ocean liners. This is from the Italian line. This is out going out to the Mediterranean somewhere. Um, New York is the, the hub of all this tra transatlantic. And actually, t uh, it's the point um, where shipping goes out to all over the world, really. Um, if you get another close up again, you can see all of the uh, ocean liners of the different lines lined up at the piers. And again, what you see also is then behind the piers, um, you have these sort of factory uh, districts where things that are brought in on the piers are processed. And then you have tracts of working class housing. And finally, uh, you can get a glimpse of it here in the, in the center of the island the, is where the um, high rent <coughs> business district and the houses of the well-off are. Again, you can see all the small craft that are being towed around. This is West Street. This is, um, this is about where the World Trade Center used to be. This is where the World Financial Center is now. Uh, this gives you an idea, ground level, of what the handicap of all this is, because while you can move uh, the goods anywhere around the harbor you want to a pier, when you get to a pier, it has to be all hand-loaded and taken by dray, or you can see all of the carts and trucks, and there's little, this is in the... Uh, Probably in the 20s, you still got a lot of horse-drawn vehicles uh, all lining up uh, to, to move goods. You also have the river sealed off by the solid wall of, of piers going from horizon to horizon practically. And the only way you can experience the river is to go through one of the piers and get on some kind of boat. Uh, here's an example of a heavy kind of labor that's involved. Uh, this person, they're draining per uh, perishables take coming off refrigerator cars that have been floated across the river. Now we switch to Philadelphia, and we have a totally different environment. We have a, a river, the Delaware River, which is uh, probably less than half the width of the Hudson. It's a, a single linear channel going back and forth. And then you have this T formation because you have the Schuylkill River, which is canalized, coming in more or less at right angles. And in Philadelphia, instead of you have a sm sort of small commercial area, but what you've got all along here is not commerce but industry and industry makes use of all these raw materials brought down by the canal it makes use of the water power of the canal um, this is kind of what the land looked like at the, near the beginning of the uh, 19th century you have philadelphia here the um, delaware river acts as a connector you've got all these little piedmont streams here and all these little dots or mill seats little small mills so you have actually an almost natural zoning here where you have a kind of main highway almost then you have a zone where you have lots of little water powers for small manufacturing, and that means the manufacturing tends to be small scale, very specialized, very diverse. Over here you have a belt of farmland with some more mills for milling the farm products. In here you have another belt, this is called the Pine Barrens, if any of you drive down into South Jersey, down 206. Um, it's sterile sandy soil, but it's an aquifer with a lot of water. You can, uh, even though they're very low head dams, there's lots of good water power here and there are raw materials like glass and iron, so you can make glass and cast iron down in here. Uh, this, is, this is an example of kind of what, this is actually part of our property, um, of what these small mills looked like. And you can see they're not large, and they're, each one is sort of specialized to a different pro uh, product. This one, um, in years past, was a woolen mill. But they would make things like paper, glass, gunpowder, wire, even grinding things like mustard. Um, this is Maniunk, which is in the northwestern part of Philadelphia. It's an industrial zone based on the canal. You can see the canal running through it. Um, they use the water power for the canal to construct mills. So you have a, 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 a mill zone all along the river. Uh, and then in the back of it, you have the shopping, the working class housing. You've got the parish church up on the hill. Uh, this is now, of course, very gentrified. The canal is still a water feature, but it's... Uh, now uh, a place of boutiques and fancy restaurants and that sort of thing. 
Um, this is the Delaware waterfront. Again, it looks very like New York. It's just much smaller. There's less traffic. Um, there are smaller ships. There are freighters. You don't have any transatlantic liners linking you to the rest of the world. It's very, uh, it's more insular. Uh, it's exporting what Philadelphia makes and importing the raw materials that it needs. Um, this is, these are samples of the Delaware waterfront, and it's industrialized from one end to the other. Uh, I could show you lots of these. This is a, the distant saw works in Taconi in the far northeast. Uh, this is Port Richmond a little further down. Again, you can see all the small craft and railroad cars. And off in the distance, you can see the, the business district and then the large masses of working class housing that support all the manufacturing. Uh, we go to Baltimore. We see a totally different environment. Um, it's, a, it's a drowned estuary, but it's a dead end river. Um, Instead of all those little mills that we have, we have the same kinds of streams, but there are fewer of them. There's Jones Mills that goes up here, where you've got a, little, a lot of these little industrial mill hamlets. The Patapsco is over here. And again, you don't have that lateral connector like you did in the Delaware Valley, which helps to define uh, a more integrated manufacturing zone. Instead, Baltimore becomes the metropolis of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, these are all the sort of tidal rivers that go in and out of it. Um, these are the steamboat routes, again, this is 1840, where you can go in and out. Um, it gives, and the other thing that you can see here is, of course, that Baltimore is fenced in by uh, fairly large ridges. It has no natural waterway to the, to the west like the other places do. Um, this gives you a flavor of the, tide, of the tidewater area of Maryland in the 1920s. It's still very rural. They're still rolling tobacco hogsheads like they did 300 years earlier. Uh, we see the steamboats, uh, the, the main part of the Baltimore waterfront was given over to all those small steamboats that uh, served all the points in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, here again, another view of that. And then this is moving down the harbor to show how the, uh, the commercial uh, zone migrated down in the end of the harbor. They're already starting to fill in. This is 1952, the steamboats are gone. Uh, they're filling in the harbor and it's uh, destined to become a park. Uh, then further down the river, we've got Canton, where there are um, facilities for exporting raw materials like coal and flour. And instead, what we get now, this is the modern replacement for all of these fluvial systems. They're all, they all tend to sort of look the same. We, now we've gotten rid of all that labor-intensive um, drayage and cartage, and we have container ports that are built on filled land, usually a filled-in wetland somewhere, and landscapes that look like this. And in the meantime, the tidewater left of the tidewater canals are now uh, linear parks and playgrounds. And that's the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning for everybody. Um, sorry, my English because it's very, um, very difficult for me talking in, in English. But it's very important at this moment. Um, we reinforce our joint research project uh, um, about fluvial metropolis in between University of São Paulo and Princeton University. I, I, I talk about my difficult to talk in English. <laughs> I'm so sorry for my English. And um, my first words is about the import importance of our, our um, joint research project uh, between University of São Paulo and Princeton University. And um, in a few minutes, I will, I will try to explain our research project in Sao Paulo. Uh, then, if you, 
if you like to um, found more, more, more details about the project, you can uh, find in the email, in the website. Um, this, um, the idea of um, a fluvial metropolis and the um, canal project is very important for us in Sao Paulo. Mainly for the history of the Euro European uh, canals project, and of course for uh, here. of course for in, in United States, for us is very important to understand the history of canals uh, along of the intercoastal inter canal intercoastal eh, of Atlantic or intercoastal and Erie Canal and TVA project. And uh, in the West Coast, the New Holland project. For us, it's very important, New Holland project also. And um, in South America, we research about uh, the um, waterway that link Orinoco River, Amazonas River, and uh, Prata River, this Oriamapla waterway that uh, organize the uh, fluvial seeds network yeah. of uh, South America. So okay, my English is possible, understand? Yeah. Um, as a part of the uh, network of uh, waterways that would, would uh, structure the South America Sits uh, network. Uh, São Paulo uh, State developed in 1960 the Tietê Paraná Waterway. Very inspiring in the TVA project. I suppose the TVA project was very important for this project. It's a waterway with 2,000 and 300 kilometers long, long. Uh, only in Tietê River is 700 kilometers from uh, not not reach the metropolitan area of São Paulo, but um, runs from up, upstream to downstream uh, around uh, 100 kilometers far from metropolitan area. Uh, our uh, Coast Play is a, a very narrow strip yeah, because we have um, a wall of rock wall yeah, with uh, 800 meters above of Atlantic Ocean. Then the uh, upper uh, Tietê uh, watershed where stay the metropolitan area of Sao Paulo, this part of the uh, stay of 720 meters above of Atlantic level, ocean level here. Very narrow because only 20 kilometers to reach the mountain. This is the Atlantic Ocean, this is the Santos Harbor, and this is the our harbor up 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 um, mountains. This part is uh, the Tietê Paraná waterways, and this 100 uh, kilometers long is the not navigable part of the river, the canyon region. Can uh, in this uh, picture you can. Look at this system of Tietê River. This is a very different river because uh, the spring water is located only 30 kilometers far from Atlantic Ocean, but uh, at 800 meters above, and runs 1,100 kilometers direction to uh, interland of South America, direction Buenos Aires. 
and here this Tiete, Tiete River, this, this one, have a um, great river, the name is Pinheiros River, this one, that um, um, in the beginning of a uh, 19th century, an uh, young American engineer, Asa White Billings, designed this uh, hydraulic machine composed by this great reservoir for uh, water, no, mainly for energy utilities, not, not water utilities, but energy utilities. For uh, guarantee this uh, water for the hydraulic pump station in the, in the le level of the ocean, Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this is the idea that uh, we and the University of Sao Paulo developing about the possibility to design the metropolitan area with the canals. Uh, the, the relationship in between the uh, urban design and the um, uh, canals. Uh, understand that, that the um, water is the backbone of all infrastructure. Um, here you can see the, our uh, proposal to design the uh, one uh, canal, uh, lateral, uh, lateral canal, uh, that um, avoid the um, canyon of uh, Tietê River. This distance in only, uh, in only 100 kilometers long, the gap is uh, the, the low level to upper level is uh, 120 20, uh, meters. This is the um, uh, urban fab fabric uh, of the metropolitan area. And uh, Santos, our major uh, harbor of Brazil, how you can see the intracoastal of uh, Sao Paulo State is very short, this canal, natural canal, not artificial. And this is the first lake designed by the British in, in 1906. And this is for, from Canadian and American um, builders. And this is the system of uh, upper uh, Tietê, inter interlink uh, reservoir that um, supply with water uh, the uh, metropolitan area. Only for illustrate the um, overview uh, image of São Paulo, this is the, at, uh, this is the mouth of uh, Tamanduatê River. Actually, Tamanduatê is the river of the city. Uh, this is Tietê River, uh, from east to west, direction to center of uh, South America, more 1,000 of kilo, uh, kilometers, reach the mouth, uh, uh, its mouth in Paraná River. Uh, this is the mouth of Pinheiros River. This is Pinheiros River, this Tietê River. This part is of the city is the historic center. Tietê runs from this direction to west. We designed the first urban uh, uh, flood gate and the, the first urban sluice. Sluice? Sluice, sluice, sorry. This is the with only one chamber of uh, loose, but uh, urban loose. For, um, for our point of view, uh, the fluvial metropolis of Sao Paulo uh, could, you, could develop it with the concept of urban waterways that is different of regional waterways. Because our uh, rivers is very narrow and shallow uh, canals. Uh, this is the University of Sao Paulo. Of course, Princeton University has a, a beautiful Delaware and Haritan Canal that link 
the two rivers, but the University of São Paulo has this um, canal for rowing, yes, make for rowing, for rowing, two kilometers and fifty hundred meters long, uh, works like a, like a um, lateral canal that links the mouth of two rivers. You will not, not can see these two, two mouths, mouth of the river, but the, the canal link this, these rivers. The Pinheiros River, uh, uh, right river bank, uh, hosted the uh, richer, richer uh, district of Sao Paulo, more, more rich. Huh? Okay, Mario? It's okay in English. And here you can find the, the, go the government of state of Sao Paulo today uh, uh, is build building uh, the second urban sluice uh, in this part of Sao Paulo. This. Opa. Acabou a bateria. In this, in this part, in this part of. Oh, okay. Oh. Uh, the first uh, uh, urban sluice is located at the mouth of Pinheiros River. And the second one is located uh, in the mouth of um, uh, the river that uh, that desired the border in between the São Paulo municipality at, and the uh, and Guarulhos municip uh, municipal city, né? São Paulo city and, and Guarulhos city. Then in 2018, uh, we will have uh, 191 kilometers long of waterways, or potentially waterways. Sorry, potentially because it's possible. It's possible to navigate um, or implement the canal boat in these narrow, narrow canals in two uh, artificial lakes. To Mainly in this part of the city, the poor, poorest part of the city, this interlaken, interlake, interlake uh, uh, part at south part of São Paulo, uh, hosts three millions of people. The population of Berlin, in Europe, living this part. Uh, then it's very difficult for for people that live in this part of uh, uh, of um, these two reservoirs. Uh, every day um, reach the inner center of Sao Paulo, this part, the more rich peop uh, district. You know? Then our idea is uh, interlink the river banks or the lake, the margins of the lakes and uh, canals. The second, uh, our project now uh, propose a more um, upstream upstream of Tietê River, direction to sp spring water, uh, more uh, three canal lakes, the, the name is canal lakes, well, because our idea is multiply proposal, multiply proposal for uh, flood control and water tr uh, transportation. And then this idea is uh, Design more three uh, canal lakes, direction to spring water. Then the second uh, proposal is uh, built a kind of uh, Erie Canal or Panama Canal, <laughs> the né? kind of kind of Panama Canal. Uh, the idea is is this: né? Uh, a summit canal, uh, only only 17 kilometers long. That that you link the Taia Superba Reservoir and Billings Reservoir uh, with a, a summit canal and two um, uh, 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 Sluis steps, step of Sluis, mm -hmm. okay. like Canal de Midi that link uh, Marseille, Marseille and Bordeaux, or Canal de Languedoc, um, six uh, Sluis and Direction for Tietê, and more five is loose is direction to Billings Billings Reservoir. Then we propose several uh, uh, feeder uh, canal or small lakes, artificial lakes for 
feed uh, works for, we feed uh, the uh, building style superba canal looks like the feed canal feed uh, in Delaware Haritan canal uh, here uh, mo most one uh, you have here you propose 12 feeders uh, and uh, uh, in this uh, at the summit, summit canal summit canal will have uh, four <coughs> kilometers long but one kilometer it's necessary to build this tunnel canal with two tunnels no? interlinked for um, avoid the pressure of the water and uh, this uh, idea of uh, construction the environment, environmental build, uh, building no? uh, not in nature, but an environmental building are surround of the um, river basin, uh, uh, upstream and downstream of the sluice. Like, for example, um, uh, Lavillette, Bassin de Lavillette in Saint Martin can Canal in Paris. Then, um, building style superba, we named it the Canal City, Canal City, building style superba, that um, you, d you design uh, parallel, parallel uh, lateral of the um, railroad, this railroad existing, but for raw materials. Uh, our proposal is uh, change for uh, works like uh, tramway, tramway, electric tramway, that organizes the public transport, uh, transport for people with this for uh, public transport for cargo, mailing. Of course, for fluvial uh, tourism no? and le leisure, this is one of the most uh, oldest, oldest um, uh, road or track. Sorry, track uh, that link the ocean, Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean. The name of Arthur, uh, today, the name is Rodovia uh, Indio um, Tibirisa. Tibirisa Indian, Indo Tibirisa, uh, uh, bec uh, very important. And then this is the purpose of um, artificial lakes that feed the, the works of Sluis. Is, is you can see that we propose two chambers, and in between a, a, um, a safe water chamber, and this in between the two chambers of Sluis. And each uh, each uh, each four four hundred meters, we design the joint the joint of uh, this uh, water and energy utilities with the uh, educational, cultural, and sports facilities. It's very important. We understand the the idea of the backbone of all infrastructure and of all uh, public facilities. This uh, cross of uh, waterway, urban waterway, with railroads. Then the, we preserve the natural river. This is a, a natural narrow uh, stream or uh, creek, creek, you know, creek. That today is very polluted uh, for industry of um, metal workers and um, oil plastic industry very polluted, but our purpose is recover the river shed, river basin, and um, uh, and construct this artificial canal. Um, the idea more than water energy utilities and um, educational cultural facilities, I, the idea is join, joins the infrastructure, urban infrastructure, uh, public uh, facilities, uh, equipments, and social housing in front of the uh, canal boat. And the people can um, feel uh, the, the quality of a urban environment. Uh, and uh, from your windows, uh, day windows, uh, you can see the, this uh, blue and green infrastructure, uh, the presence of the canal seat with the 
three lines, uh, line aligned, and the river banks, or the construction, the, the idea of the fluvial, uh, boulevard fluvial, fluvial boulevard, uh, or promenade of a river walk. More than uh, uh, canal transportation, you can see that for us in Sao Paulo, it's very important to understand our urban river, river and the urban canals like a system of um, lateral canals for sewage, sewage no, no, waste water, no? and, and diffusion uh, if, uh, polluted, no? the, uh, of air. No point pollution. And then the, another cro croquis, and you can see the we preserve and recover the original natural river uh, stream, you know, Greek creek, and design a lateral canal. Because the the arch of the canals in the history identifies several moments of the history, the name of Canal Mania, Professor Charles Redfield from UK identified this Canal Mania in this. Professor Charles Redfield is very important. Um, he covered the industry uh, archaeology about this, and then we designed this possibility to today, direction to 2022 uh, century, no? a new network uh, canals in metropolitan Sao Paulo area. And design, um, how you can see in this uh, uh, sketch, uh, the idea of the, if uh, in the history, the railroad born from canal, no? the idea is uh, transformate the railroad designed by raw materials, transport, to uh, under, under underground underground ground lines, no? but the underground designed by artificial new ground level. No? That it's possible design um, like André Lenotri uh, uh, to, uh, talk about about the pers um, prospect, panorama, and um, and landscape or waterscape in this case. No? Then Sao Paulo is very suffer with the, um, a kind of mentality or imaginary of uh, highway, urban highways. No? Then in this sketch we can show the possi possibility to design uh, can uh, urban canal with um, uh, urban bridge design as um, Second level, like Chicago City, you know, that designed several levels alongside of Chicago River or Paris, uh, that transformed the old uh, ground floor in the underground and the old first floor in the new ground floor. And here, it's very important from the undergraduate students uh, in the fall, we show that uh, the urban river is constituted at least for three canals, the canal, central canal for drainage and, water, and canal boat, and two tunnel canals for wastewater. This is the metro line underground. Ground. <coughs> we designed um, a, can a, a barge canal for transportation like, like a RHK, in Hur Valley, 1,350 1, tons. Another sketch for that will linked the uh, uh, housing and equipment and infrastructure alongside of canal, the canal seat. This is a second, 30, sorry, 30, 30, uh, Canal. This is uh, canal lateral of Tamanduatei River. Uh, again, uh, this uh, Tamanduatei River is our historic river. São Paulo City was, was founded by Portuguese people in this part of the. Okay, here is the first point. Then Tamanduatei is our historic river, not Tietê. And uh, the idea is construction. Here we have 17 kilometers long. 
far um, um, link the two river shad, uh, uh, um, sorry, river shad, you know, but here is only necessary four, four kilometers long. N now you, you can see several sketch about the idea of construction um, lateral canals. Here, another lateral canals inter, uh, interlink the river sheds. This is a, a central area of Sao Paulo uh, metropoli. This is another one, the uh, Tamanduatei River. The artificial, the idea is construction, uh, the uh, artificial archipelago, no? the uh, artificial islands and delta. More than archipelago, uh, the idea is to recover the idea of um, delta, but artificial deltas. No? This part of the city, this is railroad designed by uh, British, no? uh, United Kingdom, in 1867, that linked the harbor of Santos with the Campinas. And that São Paulo, um, uh, transforming uh, public uh, transport. Huh? Then uh, this part is an important part uh, of São Paulo, the Moca neighborhood, uh, that named for the um, the harbor of the Plateau, the Porto do Planalto, tá certo, Bruno? Porto do Planalto, yeah. Yeah? Okay. Then this is another Oh, it's very important to uh, talk with you that the original Tietê has uh, one kilometer wide. No? One kilometer wide. Then the, the idea is built in the environmental built with another several lateral canals and islands. This is another purpose of uh, interlake, interlink the the new uh, small lakes in the center of Sao Paulo to construct a, a landscape or infrastructure of imagining in, in um, surround of the uh, historic hill here was found in Sao Paulo. And this uh, now with the urban fabric, the idea of recover, recover the old uh, lake in this part and the artificial delta with Tietê. And you can see this at the mouth design of new um, spot of the um, uh, center of Sao Paulo. Works like, like uh, our Central Park in this part of the city, Moca, uh, historic center and Tietê. This uh, a fo focus in the when, where Sao Paulo was founded. Sao Paulo was founded like a fluvial city. This is the oldest port. It today is a most important street of Sao Paulo, like Canal Street here in, in Manhattan. Yeah? It's the most important street, this part. Yeah, the harbor, no? Pro propose. And now, in a few minutes, I would, would like to talk about another concept that structure our idea of urban waterways and fluvial metropolis. He, this is um, Pinheiros River, and the, the shadow of the arc, arch of the Cidade Jardim Bridge. And um, you, can, you can see the dredging of um, waste of the riverbed. You know? Then our just uh, we justify the uh, investments in public works from to to um, establish the waterway systems with the concept of concept of public cargo. If for us public cargo is you can see this it's possible see public cargo for us is dredging sediments of canals and reservoir. Uh, sludge, sludge uh, treatment and sludge water treatment, um, urban wastes, demolish, demolition and construction wastes, 
uh, residues of excavation. Okay. Um, um, another um, public cargo is recyclable uh, rubbish, you know, recyclable uh, waste. Amy for ecological um, ecological um, policies. No? Then um, this uh, concept is f is very important together of concept of narrow bo narrow canal and uh, narrow and shallow canal urban canal for uh, justify the investments in, in public works. Then uh, at uh, left side you can see the the name of the ports one two three four uh, the part ports urban depart port, the dredging port, mud port, transport, and eco port. Transport is a kind of uh, nave, you know? um, uh, a pavilion, uh, armazen, uh, warehouse, a kind of uh, warehouse with a uh, river bass, you know, artificial lake, where it's possible transfer from trucks and um, train the cargo. No? Then uh, this this is the uh, system of ports. Then we we propose three. Uh, oh, sorry. This we have four the part the part uh, urban ports and one uh, arrive port no? that works like uh, this assembled line of public cargo. No? Uh, opposite of assembled line of uh, Cars uh, industry. No? Uh, think about the idea of uh, industrial ecology and uh, reverse uh, logistics. Then uh, this is the three three parts. Three because it's the point of cross waterway system with uh, railroad system and motorway ring, motorway ring, railroad ring joint with the waterway ring. Then these three ports is located in three important point, points or three important corridor, industrial corridors. Uh, this uh, west uh, arch of the uh, waterway ring is the uh, in, uh, old, uh, old industrial corridor where, where was uh, construction uh, 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 trains, no? uh, metal works, uh, heavy metal works. No? Then the three ports, uh, it's possible recover this industrial area of Sao Paulo, but recover with a mentality of blue and green industry. No? Intro he, he, he introduced the industry of a metropolitan area, but with a safe, uh, safe uh, social and ecology. Um, uh, environment. Then uh, three, three ports, uh, third uh, transports and 90 eco ports uh, um, is the infrastructure of harbors no? in Sao Paulo uh, metropolitan area. Uh, actually is uh, 120 eco ports because each uh, transport has at uh, external area a eco port. Then here you can uh, we illustrate uh, one of three three parts. This is Tietê River. This is the uh, uh, motorway ring of São Paulo. Motor uh, highway, sorry, highway ring of São Paulo. This is uh, one of important uh, motorway hot highway that uh, interlink uh, metropolitan area of São Paulo with the inland of Brazil. And we uh, designed this artificial lake uh, in the, today uh, there is a lagoon, uh, lagoon, artificial lagoon uh, that uh, born because the uh, ex uh, explosion you know, of mine of uh, sand, mine of sand here, understand, mine, mine of sand. Then we designed this, um, this artificial uh, island then is proce processed the, um, the uh, public cargo aim the um, 
zero land fuel because the big problem for all metropolitan area is uh, management of land fuel. No? These artificial mountains is not uh, welcome, you know? but we, c we can think about the possibility to uh, uh, thinking about the um, the land fuel, uh, zero land fuel. Then in this part of the center, this is uh, another city, you know, not Sao Paulo city, but in the metropolitan area, is an important uh, city for uh, archaeology. Then we propose the archaeology museum, theater in front of uh, this passenger harbor, etc. The swimming pool, public public swimming pool. Here uh, is an image. This, it, this is a, a be our school. Huh? <laughs> you can see, you can see it. For us, this is more than a more than a, a building. Huh? For is a, a kind of device for think about projects. Huh? Then it's allowed for us to design this sketch. And you can see this void for with a, a, like the cast, castle of Loire River. <laughs> you can find find this. You can find this prof, uh, professor Artigas né? in this or hundred years that. He was born in this 2015. Very important professor that is very important. Uh, uh, well, design this this uh, water water ray ring. Thinking about the uh, the this device. You know, the, then um, ah, this is the, no, our proposal is. Um, uh, the name is um, uh, urban boat uh, for cargo né? Uh, that can transport it in container cargo, né? 20 containers in this. So, oh, then this 400 tons uh, uh, barge uh, propose um, uh, with uh, electric motor, motors. Né? Electric motors, it's very important. Not uh, oil motors. Né? Electric motors. Is another project of Professor Artigas that illustrated the EcoPort. Uh, again, the EcoPort is more than a uh, only wharf. Né? The EcoPort is a kind of social facilities um, corner, né? or cultural corner, or more than corner, a kind of cultural wharf and environmental wharf. Then, together, the this EcoPort. Uh, we have a uh, uh, municipal school of uh, rowing and sailing, and municipal school uh, swimming pool, public swimming pool. Then all the uh, cultural and facilities, uh, sports facilities that uh, involve the construction of uh, mentality and imaginary infrastructure of the children. Children. Mm -hmm. yeah? The Ecoport hosted the flea market, uh, flea market and the uh, hortifruti market, you know? because the uh, waterway ring recovered the uh, hortifruti belt of São Paulo. This, uh, sorry, this is Strasbourg, you know? <laughs> but not Strasbourg. In this, uh, so this boat is only for show for you the idea of the uh, passengers um, transportation or 200, uh, 200 passengers. And the idea the shelter is a photovoltaic, photovoltaic, photovoltaic is? Yeah. Uh, electric boat, you know, this. Then the, the, um, the system of uh, uh, water land, you know, of metropolitan area, uh, consider, um, think about the bus line, uh, metro line, Underground, underground met, uh, lines né? and bateau lines, né? oh, bateau, no, sorry, boat lines. Well, this is uh, the uh, flash. <laughs> sorry, uh, very speed, but if, if you have interest, you can find this more information in this uh, 
Metropoli Fluvial Group is a uh, in name of the 30, more than 30 researchers like uh, Juliana. We can thanks for my dear Mario Gandelsonas and for inviting us. Okay. Um. <coughs> Okay, so I think that what I see my role as here is to kind of help open up um, some of the conversation between what the study of the past can tell us about the contemporary challenge. So, you know, towards that end, um, what, I, what I'm gonna do is focus on a few themes, but I'm sure that the, you also, the two of you, and I'm sure the room has the direct questions and conversations for each other. But I also just want to start with a very general statement of perhaps the obvious, which is that there are some trends right now of, of in the contemporary world that have caused us to focus on the past. So some of those include um, an increasing flood exposure that in the United States is represented in the um, Katrina flooding of the Gulf or Hurricane Sandy more recently. Um, we have. Uh, preoccupation with climate change, and a rising interest in sustainability. So it, in, to my mind, and I'm sure the mind of many, this means that the, uh, the turn of urban design and urban planning towards the, the question of the power of water and the, the in, enlisting the power of water for the good rather than for the ill and um, the kind of stories of disaster um, gives us the opportunity to rethink the modern city uh, with a newly central preoccupation with the fluvial, which is now a word that I'm going to use all, all the time. <laughs> but uh, as Chris said, it's, a, um, it's really a, a perfect, it's a wonderful term for today. So I think that that, so essentially this, this has, so today we're going to hear a we are hearing and will hear about some of the leading examples in contemporary design in the United States and um, Brazil towards centering the fluvial. But now these current trends provoke us to be more curious about the past. And so this is, this is where we're kind of turning in part um, to Chris Bauer's really powerful story about water, the history of water as a transportation medium. Um, so this is obviously a very ancient technology, as any Google image search of canal will tell you. Um, but in particular, the fluvial transport in the 19th century United States and in the region that we're sitting in right now is a very fascinating case study. And so that's what's at hand. Um, and so this is the dialogue in front of us today. What can the historical study of water transport with this case this very broad suit sweeping case that Chris has given us offer the contemporary challenge um, of the metropolis today. And then maybe for the historians in the room, what fresh thinking can we bring to our 19th century city from the dialogue of today? And I think that there's already some examples just from the, the very first um, talk. So uh, a couple of then these thematic questions I think that will, to, to me, seem really uh, helpful and interesting. One is the historical presentation shows us that there's no simple chronological progression in the technology of water transportation or of transportation in general. I think that you know, often uh, historians of the United States or, or uh, the US American history fall into a little bit of a trap of seeing a progression. You know, first you have port cities, you have um, then canals and railroads, you have urban rail, you have paved roads, and you have air travel, you know, and variations within that. But I think that one of the most powerful things of Chris's longer paper, but also um, his presentation, is that we see the coexistence. That, you know, the, can, you know, the canals may even have many, there are still active canals in the United States, but you know, even if for the most part they've faded from our current you know, mindset, um, that they've left an imprint 
that is incredibly powerful that helps us understand the interrelationships of cities um, and that the relationship between the canals and the railroads was a symbiosis and a coexistence. It wasn't that one just displaced the other. Um, so I think that that is especially important looking at the present day to help us see that to talk about canals in the year 2015 isn't some kind of antiquated exercise, right? Like, I think that for most Americans, if you said the word canal, they would go you know, to a museum and think about the 1830s. It's not a concept that they would see as immediately present, powerful, you know, and applicable. So the fact that it's resurfacing in contemporary urban design, you know, both in the United States and maybe more so, you know, in Sao Paulo, I think is, is really exciting. And that's, you know, for, for me to be able to see this incredible story unfold of the, you know, of the 19th century and to understand that that it's in coexistence with all the forms today. And, and in fact, just asking the question, you know, why don't we in the United States think more of new canals and what, what's the capacity for thinking about rethinking old canals, like the ones that run, you know, just a mile from here? You know, is there, you know, besides, as we've said very clearly, um, it's a kind of recreational story. Chris ends the, the story very quickly. It's like it's historic preservation. You know, it's a couple of canoes being able to go up and down an old canal, and that's the end of it. But really, you know, is there a potential for commuting? Is there a potential for other, you know, other re rethinking of these older waterways, not to mention the, you know, the way that it's emerging in completely new waterways? So I think that that, that question of, um, the, the, of, of just setting aside the idea of chronological progression of obsolescence, maybe, and just, you know, kind of shelving it for the discussion today um, seems you know, really one of the, one of the lessons. Um, secondly, I think, is what maybe just to loosely say would be a question of jurisdiction, namely um, who owns these waterways and who's responsible for them. You know, you have, you have private ownership, you have, um, in the 19th century, you have private companies that uh, developed canals. You have some, as Chris tells us, it was, it was state by state within the United States. So some states retained public ownership of the canal waterways. Other states, you know, seem to have let go of that ownership. Um, but interestingly, he points out that the ownership uh, reverted to public, the canals reverted to public ownership as they became defunct during the course of the 20th century. So that question of who owns them, I think the story of the ports, you know, port authorities, um, who controls the, you know, the, um, the riverways, you know, that's one of the, um, again, one of the storylines of uh, comparison and, you know, what is the public domain. I think even those little stories of like the small, of how the barges were small family businesses, you know, that in the 19th century, that's, that's evocative. I mean, so much of the conversation about modern industrialization is this more, you know, like those small mills scattered along the riverways that led to Baltimore, you know, in the 19th century. Um, those were lost at, during a period of consolidation of corporations. But today we know that there's a return to that more, you know, kinds of um, startup industry, like let's build a, a brewery, like the first brewery in Manhattan or or the city of New York, you know, since the 19th century, perhaps. So I think that that is evoked in this structural story of the internal waterways, um, the small businesses. Um, it's not a lost, again, it's not like a looking back at the past, it's something that's gone, but is something that is very much still powerful today. Um, I think the question of region also is, and this is one, perhaps one that takes me to, you know, to me, Chris's story poses a question for the Sao Paulo case. Um, we see that um, Chris drew out both the very, as he said, the, the urban dimensions. The second part of his talk is about the impact of the internal waterways on urban development in New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore. 
But the first part of his talk was about the whole region, you know, the, the region in which cities are situated. Um, and there's different variations in that. There's the fact, like the, the regional variation in the form of watercrafts. Um, and how that was lost to the unified world of containers um, and container ports um, that does raise the question, as you showed us the new barge designs, you know, and the fact that there's a variety of ports and perhaps a variety of barge designs that in the 19th century, we would have seen this huge range of kinds of watercrafts, you know, that seems to have been lost in this you know, that, that, that's, that's still but the potential. I mean, why just say, oh, it's lost? But in fact, it's clearly, you know, the, there's the opportunity to return to that. But also, what is the larger, you know, kind of how does this region sit within the Brazilian world of regions or the South American world of regions? Like, the, it, to me, that this presentation helped us understand the, how the water rings and this new proposal relates to the region around Sao Paulo, but I find myself very curious about how unique is that in all of Brazil or, or the, um, the continent even in the way that we can see with, you know, Chris's perspective of hindsight, um, all the different regions that are taking shape, you know, on the eastern seaboard basically in the Midwest. Um, and then I guess the last kind of big theme is technology. Um, so I just, I find it so fascinating that something like the rail, every time I travel, you know, and I go into Penn Station on the commuter railroad or, and I stand online waiting to go down to the tracks and I think people have been doing exactly this for 150 years, you know, and we haven't really changed it all that much. You know, similarly the skyscraper you know, a, a preoccupation, you know, it's still with us. You know, some of the technologies are different, but it's the same urban form, like the railroad. But the canal, you know, and the steamship, um, those forms, those non-recreational, but kind of working forms of waterfront, you know, that are tied to manufacturing and, and, and shipping, um, you know, those ostensibly have disappeared. But they haven't really, I, mean, I guess that's part of it. It's like that we talk about the railroads and the skyscrapers every day. I mean, anybody in an architecture school is going to focus at some level on skyscrapers or you know, engineering. You're going to look at railroads. But definitely, you're not going to look at the canals and the riverways, right? So I think that that question of what, what kinds of technologies are, are we really talking about, the same like prism cuts you know, that, that we were in, you know, in the 19th century. I mean, what, um, what is different, what's similar seems like a, a, a really uh, a wonderful opportunity. Um, and uh, uh, let's see if there were any other um, any other kind of larger Oh, I guess that one of the things that really struck me in terms of the contemporary language that you're applying to Sao Paulo, it's like the, the multiplicity of these different kinds of ports. You know, like the, 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 you, you listed like eight different kinds. And it struck me that that was one of the, the ways, like when historians talk about the 19th century city, there, there's really not that many different ways of thinking about port cities. There's a kind of flattening out of that concept that I think you're, that is perhaps hiding different kinds of ports in the same way that, you know, Chris's detailed study showed us that like even when um, a canal comes through in the 1830s, it's not this homogenous tying together of goods or similarity of ports, but like one community on the canal might be looking at the potential for like increased urbanized land values. Whereas another city, you know, or town 10 miles along is getting something else very different, is like getting a connection to a coal field or is, is getting the connection to the international port. So I think that here there was something um, 
that to me really stood out, maybe a way that historians could be more subtle, you know, along the lines of Chris's thinking about ports um, <laughs> that you are offering us. Um, and then at the same time that Chris's studies, his differentiation, you know, kind of complements what, what you are offering us as well. So I guess those were some of the kinds of themes that, um, that stood out. So I don't know if that, if we want to just, uh, if you have thoughts about each other's presentations or. Um, yeah, maybe we should start with, uh, if we'll feel like any questions to each other or to the question and then we can talk them out. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to refresh my thoughts because I do have a question. <laughs> All right, just well, I, I, if I can start to be, uh, you know, one thing that I was, and actually even before I came here today, uh, I, I took the precaution of looking at Sao Paulo on maps and uh, Google Earth and so on, and I, I could not see all that much was, that was familiar. I mean, in other words, even if you go back to things as basic as that bedrock geology that I showed you, much less of what's the surface, um, it's very, very different. And of uh, the whole orientation of the river system is very different because, as it points out, the coast is a very shallow thing, whereas here the coast is. That was one of the great advantages of, of the people who settled here was that they found a, a nice, wide, kind of welcoming coast. And, and also, one, frankly, by being flat, it was also very easy to colonize and move into quickly and, and in fact, displace the people who lived there uh, previously. Um, but this was totally different, and the fact that the rivers of Sao Paulo flow into the interior, and they, they re-enter the ocean through an entirely different country, uh, which again made it uh, awkward, at least here. Uh, and of course, this was true in the United States very early when the um, Spain controlled the Mississippi West the, you know, before the Louisiana Purchase. In the very earliest phase of this country, the, the Mississippi exited through a foreign country, but of course it was annexed. And Nowadays, I mean, that entire system is all under one government, essentially. Uh, and that's from is very, very different. Um, there are a number of other things. I mean, in, in terms of similarities, I mean, one of the things you can see was that canals are usually have a prison shape, locks have wider gates, and that's been the same all the way since the Renaissance. I mean, you can go back and see those things in Leonardo and the Ritchie's notebook. Uh, and those haven't changed. And, and they haven't changed because, like a lot of natural forms, they're kind of the best fit. Um, the other thing that um, I, I found interesting was, again, I think you know it's a very all-encompassing plan, a very interesting one uh, in that respect. And I do think um, it reminded me of looking at it that there were um, a lot of regional plans done in this country, um, going back to include things like the Chicago Plan Commission, and especially the uh, Regional Plan Commission. York that uh, tried to impose this kind of rationalization, but of course the, the whole clash of various, you know, private and public other other interest groups tended to prevent that. You got a kind of piecemeal development out of it in the end. And in some ways the uh, the plans of the, of the the early plans of the Port Authority are in a way almost kind of too rational. They're they're too utopian. I'm not exactly utopian, but they're they take a big view and everything is put in its right place, so to speak, and clearly, as we learned over the, in the intervening years, the actual society is a lot messier and there are people who don't want things in their neighborhoods and so on and so on, and there are vested interests in truckers and railroad companies and you know, all sorts of things to make the, the whole reality much more, especially in this country, I think, much, much messier. I don't know again whether um, I mean, the, the TVA is, is, is a very good example, but it was one that also was a kind of special case in a way, and it kind of lost its original uh, kind of idealism. I mean, and it became just, in a way, it comes another public utility act. Right? Um, so, I mean, that, that's, I think, you know, the, the difference I can see right off the bat, and I don't know whether, uh, how, you know, how much uh, of the same process will occur if you try to implement some of these designs. I do think it, Again, it's certainly, it's certainly much more forward-looking and I think it embodies much more analytical thinking, the kinds of things that we're going to do in the past. Uh, because again, as Alison pointed out, these various crises of, of waste and, and whatever are, are much more on our mind to 
certainly uh, in the early 19th century, that was the last thing that anybody was behind this country. Uh, the, the, the object was to get stuff built as fast as possible and with very little concern for consequences. Um, now we, we at least have a, a track record where we don't we know that. Um, so I, I hope by starting from a cleaner slate that the, the, you have a better chance, I guess. Um, you know, I have a I have a question, or basically a comment about uh, that, that that's in a way brought up by your uh, comparison, uh, which is that actually a, an element that we didn't have here in this discussion is the fact that the cap the the old city and the capital of Brazil was Rio and not São Paulo. And it was the most important city for a long, long time. And the geographic conditions of Rio are, I mean, are a lot closer to the geographic conditions I feel than of the American cities. That is, San Pablo has a very, very difficult geographic situation, being a plateau as Alexandre uh, told us, 800 meters above the level of the sea. So, uh, and now because of different uh, political, economic circumstances, the capital is moved somewhere else to Brasilia, and the most important uh, city of, uh, in Brazil is a newer city, which is Sao Paulo. So what I'm saying is that actually this makes it a very unique and very uh, special case, and uh, that is, I, I don't know if there are infrastructural, comparable infrastructural projects in Rio or in Brasilia, for instance. And, and here you have New York being the most important city for centuries and still being the most important city in the Northeast. So I'm saying I feel that that's a very a crucial element that we need to take into account in our conversation. Or maybe Ricardo. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I would like to thanks for uh, mainly for Edison as it felt for as it felt for the world. I would like to talk about your question, Mario. That that um, I'd like I would like to talk about the desperate for Sao Paulo, uh, Rio de Janeiro was the second capital. The first one was Salvador, the second Rio de Janeiro, the, to, today's cultural capital. But the history of uh, Sao Paulo city, some uh, historian, uh, historian, historian recognized that Sao Paulo was founded uh, at least three times. Huh? Sao Paulo Railway, which was built from British in 1867, 1870. We can think that this is a moment when the Sao Paulo had a quick, quickly uh, developed not the city center, but uh, works like a node uh, yeah. that link the Atlantic Harbor in the <coughs> uh, to the raw materials of Finland, Brazil, to the to the part, uh, because the British people designed only a hundred kilometers long of the railroad. Railroads just located just a, a, a point of Brazil, strategic uh, strategic line uh, that uh, drained drained the cafe. Uh, the historian people identified this this railroad, some Paulo Sao Paulo Rail railway, is was. Uh, Railroad that um, look at the, 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 the more look 
more profitable. More profitable railroad of the world. Because only investments only 100 kilometers for drainage. <laughs> All <laughs> production of this. In the second moment, uh, is, uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the uh, 19th, 19th century, is a Brazil Canada agreement that found the Lighting Power Company, the uh, <coughs> company for uh, energy utilities, for public energy. Tramway, electric tramway is the second moment. Sorry for no, no, not very, but it is it's very interesting to think about this moment because before this moment, uh, Sao Paulo is a small village. The same is very difficult to compare it, but it's similar of uh, Chicago city. From my point of view. Uh, here in Canal, and here in Canal was the moment of the real independence of the United States, the construction of here in Canal without causing a link, the, the, this uh, nature of the uh, Atlantic Intracoastal, the Hudson River, the Great Lakes. If it, before this, if the new France uh, that link uh, uh, Quebec in Montreal, Montreal with uh, of, at the mouth of the uh, Mississippi River is a desire of the French people no? to bring the mentality of the uh, imaginary of uh, the art of built canals no? or the Vauban and uh, no? etc. Uh, the United States uh, link with this um, part of the hinterland, the green, uh, lake, Great Lakes, and this maybe, I suppose, uh, sorry to uh, talk about, but maybe it's very interesting for us to understand that the Chicago grown grow very quickly, no? Yeah. With the canals and the railroad network. Yes. And Sao Paulo, it's the same, not the same, because it's another, another, um, another aim, no? The, Actually, the uh, Brasca agreement uh, is, was more than uh, a project of utilities, uh, energy utilities. Uh, the narrow canal of Sao today in Sao Paulo uh, is a uh, consequence of the uh, hiding purpose, uh, hiding thinking that is uh, landing reclaimed. Again, for our point of view, the University of Sao Paulo, for the, our research group, from the research group, we prefer to talk about the, that we uh, invited, uh, slotted, and sent and sell the, the, the uh, major uh, hidden bank of the, the river, our river. You understand that? Yeah. Major river bank, not a flood plain, mm -hmm. because major concept flood plain is behind this a concept of the if we is we name it a flood plain, then we can occupy this flood plain like the mm -hmm. Hudson yeah. river banks. No? If the, if you claim it, no? it, it, it's it's the same. It was the same no? in Sao Paulo. Uh, then it's very important to talk with the the graduate students at the PAUS, that is a public school of the country, that you, what is rhetoric talking, uh, rethinking the, uh, the, the name of the, the urban river, urban canals, not, not a, a lost uh, landscape, mm -hmm. because it's lo lost landscape. Uh, but we must to think about the possi possibility to uh, project with the environment, environmental build today. Possible recover the, the old uh, one kilometer wide 
amputated uh, big uh, liver band. Because it will not uh, rectify in, in a straight, straight, straight uh, narrow and shallow canal. Actually, we divided uh, a lot and sell our primordial public space. That is the public space of uh, liver. Because the backbone of all infrastructure uh, works together and integrated and inter uh, dependent of the, uh, this backbone that is urban water. Try to answer your, mm -hmm. your questions. And another question that you talk in Christopher and Mario is about the, how you can structure our food uh, uh, cities network. Uh, so Brazil has three uh, big, big uh, uh, watershed regions uh, uh, Amazon, uh, Amazonas River, bad, uh, watershed. It's an international leadership. Uh, the Plata leadership is an international the springs of the uh, Plata. Uh, the, sorry, the Amazon is not the uh, springs, is uh, Ecuador. Mm -hmm. okay. But we have uh, the San Francisco, San Francisco leadership, the San Francisco River, is the totally uh, located at the Brazil territory. Yeah? The springs and the mouth is totally, totally the spring territory. In the, night, in the 18th century, um, uh, Dom Pedro II uh, de Mario took with uh, the Dutch people to organize the network of uh, <coughs> six parts, rivers, river seats, along, along of the San Francisco River. Mm -hmm. From spring for Minas Gerais, uh, Minas Gerais State, direction to uh, uh, Bahia State, Bahia. Very the first project from 19, 19, 19 oh, sorry, 18, 18 century. Because uh, one of this uh, uh, canal mania is just this moment when the United States and Europe never stopped the construction. Uh, Canals, even for the future, the, 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 the planning of the European community will be construction more 2,000 uh, uh, canals, natural, 2,000 uh, kilometers of canals, and construction more uh, sluices and other coverage, for example, Antwerp. And so, Brazil. Think about Fluvial Metropolis. You can remember, for example, Belém do Pará, that's the mouth of Amazonas River, <laughs> constituted by 30 islands, eh? natural islands. This is uh, our Fluvial Metropolis. <laughs> but several problems of uh, uh, sanitation, and, uh, because the question of urban rivers talk about sanitation and health. <laughs> Second sector is talk about the education culture. Right? The sanitation in health is very important because Belém do Pará is a beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, and strategic localization. For example, like in St. Petersburg, that is a, a cross section of the Mariinsk Canal that link uh, White Sea, Black, Baltic Sea, and Black Sea. Project designed 300, 300 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, São Paulo not organized for a uh, important uh, uh, natural uh, waterway that Amazonas River, a uh, network of fluvial cities. Of course, uh, Belém do Pará, Santarém, Manaus, uh, we can name it like, like a fluvial city, but only a hundred meters far from. The bank of uh, Black uh, ne Negro, Rio Negro, Manaus. The Manaus has, has the same problems of our uh, spread uh, periphery, uh, periphery. 
São Paulo. Then, uh, I think or understand the uh, Canal City is understand this, what you're talking about. The, we design a, a wooden fabric uh, where we can see and feel that this atmosphere and mm -hmm. environment, see and see and feel. Always the presence of the canals mm -hmm. and trees, no? canals shaded, shaded by like an artificial, like a sorry, a green marquise, no? mm -hmm. that what construction this quality of urban urban space mm -hmm. and, and from regional waterway system that organize the structure of the uh, network for the cities from. To, sorry, to urban waterways. Um, maybe in the history of, of Brazil, Belém do Pará, Porto Alegre. That Porto Alegre is, is the point of at the mouth of uh, a river that uh, at uh, La Bode Spats. La Bode Spats is a kind of uh, Atlantic intracoastal. Maybe from Porto Alegre to Rio Grande, Rio Grande is South of uh, the smaller south of uh, Porto Alegre, uh, is would be linked for La Bode Spats, like Miami and Jacksonville, mm -hmm. uh, or like Miami to Boston, passing through Delaware, mm -hmm. Alita Canal. But um, unfortunately, uh, natural geologic questions, uh, because in the Santa Catarina states, Mountains uh, approach to Atlantic Ocean, and then we have a uh, difficult to, to yeah. today. Then uh, the only uh, moment when the, in, the, in the past of Brazil uh, we think about the artificial fluvial metropolis was to when uh, Moritz from Nassau, the Dutch mm -hmm. people. Found the Recife. Recife. Uh, maybe it's a uh, strategy located. Think about the idea of projects, natural hate, uh, natural. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, Think about Recife. Uh, yep. Fair. I didn't want to interrupt. No, no, I'll maybe you didn't finish your. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Never finish. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, Claire. Yes. So um, uh, I appreciate all three presentations, actually, including uh, Alison's uh, reflections on them, which uh, made me think a lot. Um, I have a lot of questions, uh, but I'm not going to toss them out now because it will take forever. So I will focus on a couple, which is. Um, Alison brought up the issue of the public, and um, she was uh, asking about jurisdiction and who owns the waterways and the history of ownership um, in the United States, and that raised the question for me, well, what, what does this project entail in terms of uh, its proponents and backers? Um, um, understanding of what ownership will be like on this either now and the, uh, and the entire infrastructure, watery infrastructure of a new fluvial cell pump. And um, when I ask that, I mean, what exactly does the pub, what, if it's going to be public, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean that it will be state owned uh, or municipally owned, or what, 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 if, what precisely does that mean? And alongside with the public, I'm also curious about the financing. Um, what are the, uh, what is the funding for this? And is it something that is going to be financed by domestic capital, by foreign capitals? Where is the massive investment coming from? And um, if there are any bonds involved, because bonds are public debt. 
And so I am very curious about the realm of the public at all levels in terms of control, in terms of access, and in terms of being saddled with the debt of this forever. Um, so that's a big concern that I have a question. And in terms of access, um, public access. I am very interested in the drawings and photographs that you provide, and this is probably something that's going to come up. I, I, didn't, I didn't have papers beforehand, so I don't really know the details for you proposing, but um, I'll be commenting in the second section. Maybe then the presentations will elaborate a little bit more on that. But in the slides that you presented, Alexander, I see something that is quite different from what Chris was showing in his uh, towpath canals with the family barges. That is, uh, that is a very democratic access uh, that is not top down, what Chris was describing, at a certain moment in the development of the canal systems in the United States, where they may have been built by entities that are, by polities of one dimension or another, but whose usage and access was rather democratic, or apparently, at least by the slide, um, kind of democratic. I mean, family, small enterprise families are just going back and forth and nobody's stopping them. It's presumably they dock somewhere. Presumably they navigate and use the lock system and benefit from it for their own family sustenance. So in looking at your slides, I, mean, I wonder to what extent is that even possible there or contemplated there, that there would be a sort of bottom up type of economic usage of these waterways, and does the design allow for that? Because the design that you have has public facilities and public oriented if, um, things of many kinds, which are very nourishing, but it's top down, it's not bottom up. And so um, I wonder, and then, so that takes me to the third realm of the public, which is the decision making. Um, my understanding is that the research uh, has gone from the state asking you to allow to think about a plan and to, you know, to think, globally think about all of this. Major challenge. Um, so uh, this is going to involve a lot of money. It is going to be involved a major. Uh, reconstruction of the entire built and unbuilt landscape of an entire region that is going to affect the lives of millions. What is the decision-making process for approving the project, including its design and financing, as well as property jurisdiction usage? Um, that, that part I don't know, and perhaps you can't answer it, but I'm very curious about the political aspect of this, about um, is there going to be, you know, in the United States there is this system of initiatives. People put initiatives on the ballot. It's supposed to be democratic, or the discourse is that it's democratic. Actually, it's profoundly anti democratic, but never mind. They're there on the ballot, and people vote, you know, do we want a bond for X or Y? Do we want such an educational measure, yes or no? So it's like a referendum. Is this subject to some kind of referendum? of all the municipalities that will be encompassed by the project or not. So yeah. things like that. Those are the, so all for stemming from the questions of the public that Alison was raising. I would like yeah. to respond. <coughs> um, actually, uh, Bruno is suggesting that we collect a couple of comments and then you push perhaps answer. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's be, yeah, so well, that in a way will also help us control the time. So, uh, Ricardo, you have a question? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, um, starting uh, for the ending, I think I could uh, perhaps answer part of your third question in the afternoon. Not as a, as a uh, senior professor, but as a state officer yeah. in the state of Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. Because I think uh, it would be better explored mm -hmm. in the afternoon. Okay, uh, but, um, so, Ricardo, before you answer, then you—that's what you would like to do. But you, do you have a question? Because I want to collect. Yes. Yes. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I have a question. Uh, um, commenting. Um, 
uh, Alison question about um, uh, some sort of uh, recreational history uh, in dealing with uh, canals and uh, water works on the contemporary cities. Um, I think that I would see that uh, uh, to a very limited extent. I mean, uh, what we are talking about is about new uh, potentials of, uh, uh, of water of multiple scope uh, of uh, purpose water and urban management, uh, which are uh, brought by a, um, a very sharp increase on uh, land prices. Yeah. Um, this justifies uh, public works or uh, water works that in the past were not uh, uh, feasible. And um, in this prospect, uh, I think uh, I, I would, would like only to comment your question that um, uh, we are facing a very different movement from that uh, uh, in the 19th or in the beginning of the 20th century. And I think the project Alexander showed is um, uh, uh, it's, uh, 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 mixing some, uh, some different moments. Uh, it's not a, a clear chronological idea from what was the past what are the uh, feasible ideas on the short term and what are the uh, utopias that are a valid exercise in a school of architecture but are not feasible in the, this very moment. Mm -hmm. and so this I, I, I would uh, hear also Alexander about that because um, it, it's important to, uh, to make us uh, a, a distinction between these moments and these prospects of uh, real feasibility of these components. Altogether, they make uh, a, a, a very interesting idea of the metropolitan waterways and the, of the metropolitan integration between <coughs> the city and the water. But uh, if we do now a, a, a timeline for the future, Certainly, part of it uh, will be feasible by in the short term, and part of it is to be just in a very, very long time in the future. Do you, do you um, agree with that? I for, well, yeah. um, I have, I'll take one question from Bruno, and I myself have a question, but then do you want to go first? Or? Sure, mine, mine was just a, a comment and sort of few footnotes to tie together some of the other questions and Alexander's comments. Uh, one that I think is, it might be important for those that don't know the, some of the areas Alexander is discussing in greater detail, but just the extent of the variety of kind of patterns of, of land use and kind of historical patterns of, of development in the areas that Didra now covers. So from the extreme of the poorer areas between the lakes uh, on the sort of the outer boundaries of the ring, were basically areas where people came and then infrastructure came. And in many cases, infrastructure has not arrived, right? In a lot of cases, very basic sewage uh, systems, which is always the example I give to my students when I'm all for bottom up, but when my students revert to bottom up too enthusiastically and too quickly, that's the first example. You cannot build a sewage system bottom up, right? There's just, exactly. there's, <laughs> there's a time and place for, for top down. Um, uh, and then in the other central areas, and this is a question of jurisdiction with the, in, the, in, in our sort of historical um, scale, in the central areas of the river, it's precisely the opposite. The infrastructure came before the people. And here there were stories, and, and this is something uh, Alexandre was, we were talking about last week, or he, he was telling me, uh, the, the British companies who would get concessions for waterways for generating electricity garnered most of their profits from sort of flipping the land. So they would artificially flood some of the areas of these central rivers um, so that they would own it, uh, take the infrastructure, and sell it for very high prices. And these are the areas that are today largely garden cities that were developed in the first 15 years of the 20th century. So really, as drastically different patterns of occupation as you could come up with, right? So there's an, something here that, in a sense, tries to remedy it and even it out um, and to sort of catch up to, to areas that just expanded uh, way, way 
you know, completely out of control of the state and regulation, uh, particularly the peripheral areas. The other one was just a comment that, uh, to respond to, to, to your exercise of going to Google Maps and trying to find patterns and, 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 and now going back even further to the 16th, 17th century. Um, uh, what became Brazil, and this is why it became Brazil with its contours, is, is a much more uh, uh, integrated um, and extensive river system than what you had in what became the continental US. Right? Um, so yeah, I mean, we could talk about that for that's, I suppose, a, a different um, workshop. But you could almost think as, as Brazil having gone from rivers to railroads without a regional system of canals, as in the United States. And some of this had to do with the fact that you had, it was seasonal in the monsoon <coughs> season, but you kind of had a river system that from Sao Paulo extended way into the lowlands. And the reasons that there was this shift from the northeast, a lot of your examples were from north, northeast, <coughs> to the southeast, had nothing to do with the topography, so it wasn't something akin to what happened in the United States, um, you know, where the Erie Canal made New York into what it became, et cetera, but it, it had to do with the gold rush that in Brazil's case happened 100 years before the U.S.'s, right? So the sort of economic, political power shifted to the southeast, um, and well, yeah, it's a different conversation. But just to give you a sense of how these, these different developments compare at the scale which Chris uh, introduced. Yes. To. Good, thank you. Uh, Bruno, I, well, this is, for the time being, one more comment question. But what I'm thinking is that actually, well, I would stretch the session. I think, if, I mean, if you're not uh, that hungry, I, think, I guess we all are. But maybe you can tell me, okay, we want to go to for lunch, but maybe we can stretch it by another 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and also, uh, I think that we'll probably go back to some of these issues at the end of the day. But uh, my question uh, goes back to, uh, starts with uh, the first uh, uh, issue that Alice brought, which for me is very important, very interesting. Which is how, do we, uh, how do we approach the notion of history, in the right word, when you said there is no progression? Uh, that struck me, uh, and also I'd like, and I would like to finish with the, the issues that there are brought up uh, with respect to, uh, I mean, more uh, questions related more to economic, financial issues, etc. So um, the the first question for me it relates to why are we talking about these issues now, and for how long have we? talking about these issues. And I think it's really important to remember, at least here in America, that this is incredibly recent. That is, as far as I remember, looking at water as this, let's say, symbolic commodity in cities, or imaginary commodity in cities, goes back only 25 or 30 years. And uh, that is uh, at the point where people started to think that perhaps uh, the edges of rivers, of, of the ocean, could be beautiful. And I'm bringing this up because uh, actually uh, this, this uh, initiative was brought up by Arlington, and that's what we do. So, uh, so I just want to mention four images that, in a way, uh, uh, struck me. Uh, first, your uh, your view of Manhattan and the docks, the, the the edge, totally occupied with the docks and the liners and the ships. That is a city uh, walled towards the river where there is no visual access, or I would say no access, but basically, I mean, what I'm discussing now is the visual access. No, I mean, it's like no preoccupation from that, no interest in that, because it's not in our consciousness. And then, uh, because I've been here for now 45 years, uh, the changes that actually started in the 70s, 80s, when we started to demolish everything, open up the edge, invented the artificial beach that became Battery Park City. And I'm saying that because it felt, it looked like a beach suddenly opened up to, to the sea. 
And so <coughs> that's, for me, a very important, I mean, and now thinking of all the architecture that is taking place near the edge, the high line, et cetera. Um, so what I'm saying is that there, in my view, there is a symbolic rank, and that's one of the issues we didn't discuss, uh, in the way we conceive of the edges of the city. Uh, now, uh, the same thing that the other two images were, um, the one I have in my mind of the uh, uh, rivers in San Pablo that are almost invisible again. I mean, you basically don't see them. And then your images bringing Artigas, the architecture of Artigas to the river, making now a spectacle of that edge. So I I'm, I'm basically have a, uh, a question about to what extent this break uh, will totally change. I mean, that, that perhaps is, could be the impulse that will change our urban uh, agglomerations into fluvial metropolis. And perhaps the engine is going to be related to economic questions, in particular to the fact that the most important, the first industry in the world right now is tourism. I mean, that's basically, that's where the billions and billions of dollars are being moved. And, uh, and we know that in, a, in very few decades, New York was totally known as a uh, place for tourists to come. It's one of the major centers, 50 million people, I think, a year. And uh, you know, that's perhaps one of the reasons why uh, something like the high line could happen. So anyway, so what I'm saying is that I think it could be interesting perhaps even to go back to the, this at the end of the day after Paul presents his project because to talk about uh, infrastructure in, as an architect in terms of section, which is what you are going to be doing, means that we're going to look at the edge of the city in a completely different way. And um, so anyway, it's, you know, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a question that perhaps we should confront. So I don't know if we want to, perhaps you, uh, Chris, and Alexander want to start uh, with the uh, questions that uh, were brought up by um, Vera. Well, uh, if I may, to take yours first, yeah. I think I, one of the reasons, uh, and unfortunately, yeah, I mean, I, I cut my presentation arbitrarily, I didn't show. All of those port cities, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York, they were all redeveloped as recreation centers, every one of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I, what I did was to pair that with the container slides, because really, that's the kind of conceptual change that made that possible. But uh, the economics of all that hand labor, uh, the problems with unions, obviously, we could die before you had a lot of unskilled people in the long term with unions. Uh, just the, the basic need to reduce costs and moving things by container rather than by hand, that had to be sort of put in place before the waterfronts could be reclaimed in a way. Uh, and that took things like the various port authorities that would condemn large pieces of land and build these big container forts. Um, to, to go back to, you, to some of your questions, uh, yeah, the, the top-down versus bottom-up uh, business is very, very interesting. I shouldn't have really given the conclusion, uh, given the impression that all of that was bottom-up. It, it, it was a variety of things, um, and there there are there were a variety of uh, depending on the services. I mean, there were a lot of these uh, family things that were sort of like a, kind of like independent truckers. Then there were also groups and lines that moved. Uh, things move somewhat like the way UPS does now uh, on regular schedules or they move passengers. And those required more capital. They required having agents in various places. Um, however, there was, because of those family that, uh, boat people, they, uh, that was a, a political pressure on the states to make sure that those people had access to opportunities. Um, and that's in the large. Again, we're talking about the Jacksonian here in American politics, and that was a very big, uh, big concern. And you'll see uh, there's, there's obviously a certain amount of conflict between um, the 
wealthier people who control these, these lines and who have to have uh, more of their, have more capital at their command to have different slaves and warehouses and things, as opposed to the proprietors. And there's always this political pressure to make sure that the little guy uh, can have an opportunity. Uh, and that's also you know, part of the uh, reason why, in New York especially, there's a movement, I didn't go into that either, to when, as the Erie Canal becomes obsolete, to replace it with what's called the Barge Canal, which yeah. is a, a much larger thing. But part of it, again, was still, uh, again, to allow, at least theoretically, individuals to, to participate. Uh, the problem, well, there's a corollary to that, which is, of course, when you get a steamboat, that's a, a big capital cost, so only yeah. wealthy people have, can own steamboats, and a lot of them, some of the first big American fortunes are built on owning steamboats. Same thing with the railroad. Uh, a railroad has to have a centralized control. It's very capital intensive. Yeah. Uh, it has to be run top yeah. down. And so there's that. There's always that conflict between the waterway people and the railroad and steamboat people. Um, and the, the great political pressure in favor of waterways is to act as a lid keep that railroad rates and mm -hmm. to provide the railroad with competition that goes on really up until the middle of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and again, that's why the government, act. but the other thing is that it becomes clearer and clearer that the eastern rivers don't offer the kinds of economy of scale that are needed as things get bigger and bigger. And as I laid out in the paper, there's always this balance between the economy of scale you get with having a bigger boat with the problem, the natural problem, having a lot of water to float that boat. Um, so, what happened was really that the the political battle and focus moved to the western rivers, the Mississippi system, where the, the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, has, has developed uh, large lock systems. And of course, even then, then, then that becomes a, a, a sort of trade-off with the environment, and then the people who, uh, uh, you know. The, the bigger these dams get, the more intrusive they become on the environment. Uh, mercifully, these smaller canals I was talking about in my lecture were, uh, were not of a scale that they interfered with the environment quite so much. Um, they are not. That, yeah, they are not as. The problem is that they are not. Sorry, it's very yes. I have to leave. Yeah, uh, okay. Okay. I have an appointment at one fifteen. Firstly, I'm so, so sorry for my the misunderstood for my presentation very quickly and certainly to sh short cut several points and issues that the um, Fulvia project um, uh, put for us. Uh, of course, uh, definitely, definitely uh, this uh, project is not a top-down project because uh, we talk about the importance of think about the basics. Uh, infrastructure of infrastructure is the ethical approach for humanity, social, public, and collective. Without this infrastructure of infrastructure, we, we can talk about everything. But before, uh, beyond, the above, technical issues, we need to recognize the, that the problem of the urban river and urban canals not, do not the uh, technical or hydraulic problem. It is a social and political uh, issue. Then when you talk about the, the spread, the welcome spread uh, and capillary network uh, of small and narrow, and narrow Canals. I remember of Jean Vigo, uh, La Talent, uh, and uh, marvels of uh, small mules and narrow boats. Uh, uh, yes, the Fulvio uh, Metropolis project. And we talk about Canal City and flooding in studio. Uh, it's three concepts, three devices canal, bridge, and tower. Tower not means this skyscraper, but means the three. Conquest, you know, uh, we designed the topography of the valley, uh, designed the multiply the ground floor. Uh, I also talk about the plane station, that's several hmm. levels of uh, platform uh, for 
back, but we can think about the idea of uh, invasion of the landscape, you know? because the invasion in invasion landscape is about this. But Professor Ricardo Toledo, this, this <coughs> afternoon, talk about maybe talk about this uh, uh, private and public partnership and old school project because it's very difficult in three minutes, but yep. I would like to talk about that. <laughs> the project's collective project. Thank you. Sorry. <coughs> and uh, I, can, I can talk about, uh, it's very important. Yesterday, uh, we took the, 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 the train from Princeton to New York. New York. Right. And from the middle of the train, you can stop. Several lagoons, or mm -hmm. several flood, uh, flood yeah. areas that uh, indicate that this uh, occult uh, Atlantic intracoastal, even if they reclaim it, uh, and then if you can allow to talk about this in your country, that's for me. Erie Canal in Delaware, Harika Canal, approach with our project because uh, some power through the metropolis is more than a network of parts and parts or uh, uh, river city or canal city or park city. But we can join three policies, federal policies from water policy, and mobility policy, and uh, waste policy, federal. Aiming to uh, recover uh, the natural world of the past, mm -hmm. but to put in the, in the future, no? mm -hmm. recognize the past mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, today, tomorrow, like three important moments. The past uh, technology, this the, 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 the Erie Canal, this natural, natural canals of the United States, uh, for me, part of the view, it's important for our research in Sao Paulo. I would like to talk about the possibility to link of the idea to recover this uh, canal city from Manhattan, Albany, uh, Buffalo, Detroit. Uh, of course, with tourism, fluvial tourism, but uh, a pleasure, leisure, and of this uh, hydraulic machine, of the public cargo, because uh, the land field is a big problem. Uh, the land field, uh, the, the public cargo, is uh, the feasibility, the mm. investments. Is, uh, can't really talk about this. Then, mm. then, the north, north, north east side of American states, United uh, States, the the uh, the and how Buffalo maybe can recover the uh, assembly line. Kind of three-port disassembly line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Alexandre, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it, uh, it's clear for uh, for people here uh, the fact that I think you mentioned it very quickly the fact that the goal is uh, this idea of zero landfill. I don't know in uh, how many decades, which is uh, I think a very important component in the objectives of the. Movement of, uh, of uh, waste. Uh, only for the point of view of academic research, uh, start a dialogue with, or continuous uh, uh, welcome that dialogue with the uh, government. Uh, is uh, think about the state policy that more than uh, only four years of uh, mayor, major mayor, mayors or Governor, governor. Then we propose uh, eight uh, administration, eight. Or <laughs> that's th three, three, thirty, uh, hundred, each, thirty, thirty, thirty-two, hundred. No, thirty-two. Thirty-two. Thirty-two, yes. <laughs> Not thirty, hundred. Thirty-two, years. <laughs> 30, 30, 30, 30. Yeah. And uh, it's possible to think about short term and medium and long term. But the investments, uh, for example, the uh, 
two days, uh, more, less than uh, $100,000. Huh? Uh, today, uh, it's Luis, uh, Huber is Luis, the cost is the, the price. Huh? It's about uh, 150,000. Huh? Feasibility: 45% of the public investments in the uh, uh, and public works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been uh, one, uh, one fifteen. I don't know if you want to uh, expand on your comment, Ricardo, or we'll keep it for. So we we, we can always come back at the end. Yes. Okay, so thank you everybody. This was a very, very good uh, session, first session.